Hello dear viewer, well it feels like only yesterday, but now it's time to review Resolution. I do see this as the finale of series 11. I know some people were disappointed by the lack of a Christmas special, but I do appreciate that this special at least embraces it happening on New Year's Day. And there are a few plot elements that refer to that. There's nothing to absolutely make it that this episode had to happen on New Year's Day. Whereas some of the Christmas specials, well, they're filled with Christmas imagery, but if they didn't happen on Christmas Day, it may not affect it that much. Famously, The Runaway Bride was meant to be part of Series 2, but was pushed back to the Christmas special later on, with Rose replaced in the plot by a piece of string. Not even making that up, Rose was meant to be flying the TARDIS while the Doctor was hanging out of it on the motorway. But I digress, we're talking about Resolution, not The Runaway Bride. It's just that The Runaway Bride is basically perfect. Moving on. Once again, like the first episode of this series, we are without the title sequence. And look, there are even more obvious spots here where they could have put in the title sequence, like when the Khaled mutant is writhing around in the bag. That could have made a really good moment. When the third guardian is shot off his horse with the arrow, that could have made a really good moment. The Third Guardian is one of the first problems I have with this episode because it looks like he is riding his horse down a pretty well beaten path for the time period, but it's like no one discovers his body. Like at the time, it just gets covered in dirt. I'm picking way too early because generally I really like this episode. I like the energy of it. I like the structure of it. When I was watching it this time, I specifically made a note of what was happening around the 15 minute mark each time, thinking it's like an old four part story with some of the fat trimmed out. At around the 15 minute mark is when the Doctor figures out that the creature is a Dalek. At the 30 minute mark is when the Dalek gets its gun. And that is a great shot when Lin reaches in and pulls out the gun and just looks at it. Just in common with the rest of this series, the camera work and the cinematography has been exemplary. And the last cliffhanger, of course, is when the Dalek, restored, screams exterminate at the Doctor. And of course the Doctor short circuits it, that's how we get out of that cliffhanger. But I think having that structure really helps. It gives us rises and falls in the action. And this is quite an action-oriented episode, despite the fact that the whole thing is constructed, that the Doctor and Dalek don't confront each other until the back part of the episode. I thought to myself, what does this remind me of? And in so many ways, I feel like Chris Chibnall is doing the Doctor Who version of a Michael Bay action film. Michael Bay has done Transformers, he's done Ninja Turtles, and particularly in the early Transformers films, there was a real effort made to keep the big giant battles right down the back of the movie. So we had lots of build up to them, lots of focus on the human characters. They didn't necessarily come into contact with the villains too much until the very last act, third quarter of the film. And that is kind of what happens here. And we also have that scene where the Dalek takes on an army patrol, which I have heard was a late addition. It doesn't feel like it. It feels like a natural progression of the plot, but it's also this action sequence. And I found myself thinking, why do we have that though? We know what Daleks are like. But really, the last time we had a big Dalek action sequence was way back in 2014 in Into the Dalek, where Rusty takes on a Dalek patrol. So we really are re-establishing them for a new audience. And I think this story is quite right to take its cues from Dalek have just one Dalek there, remind us what a danger they are, but very wisely Chris Chibnall chooses to take it in a different direction and to make the first half of the story about how dangerous just the Dalek mutant is. And look, it's a standard thing in storytelling, either to make your hero look resourceful or to make the villain look more dangerous, is to strip them back 
to the bare minimum, to take away their gadgets, take away their armor, and see how they perform. And the Dalek does really well here. Another thing that I've read online is that apparently the Dalek was going to take control of a Yaz rather than a new character. And the reason that didn't happen was the main cast were publicizing the new series. And when you have an entirely new production team, entirely new main cast, a woman playing the Doctor, which is still controversial two years after it was announced, I can understand why that publicity was so important, but I so wish, in a way, that it had been Yaz, because she has been so underserved in getting really unique emotional content this series. And the weird thing is, I don't necessarily think that she has been underused, it's just that the Ryan and Graham relationship with the Doctor, with each other, has been so well served that Yaz, who's just on pretty much an average level of character progression, feels like she's so far back in the background. And I remember when this episode went out and we recorded our Jodie into Terror episode, Todd said, Yaz again gets nothing to do. And I said, excuse me, Yaz gets two things to do in this episode and both of them are escorting Lynn out of a dark cavern. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much what Yaz gets to do. But she also gets to be the Doctor's main foil. And again, Mandit Gill is very good at that and she's very good at bouncing off Jodie Whittaker. I like their relationship. Oh, but... It would have been wonderful to have Evil Yaz for a story. Hopefully Series 12 gives us a chance to see that. Of the guest cast, Lynn and Mitch are so likeable, and just in that very early scene where they're discussing their first kiss and their new attraction to one another, it could be mawkish and twee, but I think just the fact that they're so down to earth and naturalistic and also respectful of each other. It's clear that there's an existing friendship here which could be about to go to something more. I think that sells this scene. It also tells us that something horrible is going to happen to them because this is Doctor Who. And finally, we have Aaron in the guest cast, Ryan's dad. And the scenes between Ryan and Aaron and Aaron and Graham, they're just the standout for this episode. I love when Aaron comes into the house at last and the Doctor is just so cold towards him. It's that thing I've mentioned earlier where the Doctor can say something devastatingly rude in a very mild tone of voice. And she cuts right through any small talk or anything like that because Aaron wasn't there and he did let Ryan down. And the Doctor adores Ryan and Grace, so naturally she is going to immediately dislike this person. But the funny thing is, when the Doctor realises that Ryan and Aaron's talk went okay, she welcomes him aboard the TARDIS and, you know, congratulates his contribution with the microwave oven. I love the line, almost makes up for your lack of parenting skills. You know, she hasn't forgotten, and she's not gonna sugarcoat <laughs> that this is still a problem. And in the cafe, there is just this amazing bit where Ryan is telling Aaron what he needs to do to start to make things better. And the camera just stays on Tosin, and he has this monologue about what Aaron has to do. And he just gets it flawlessly done. I know I've praised Tosin throughout this entire series, and I think it's so justified when you look at this scene. And I also love that Aaron's reply, it's not Aaron falling down to his knees and begging for forgiveness. It's him explaining what is going on in his head and how, despite his best intentions, yeah, he screwed up. And he screwed up because he doesn't know what to do either. That's then bookended with that scene with Graham, who had very funnily rejected Aaron earlier in the episode, just opening the door and, nah, can't deal with this today, and closing it again. I love that scene where they're looking through Aaron's childhood memories and Graham explaining what it means to be there and how Aaron can start to make it better. Because, of course... Graham has become Ryan's grandfather over the course of this series. But that doesn't mean he's Aaron's father. 
that doesn't mean Aaron accepts him in the way that Ryan does. You know, he questions the whole Gramps thing. Like, oh, are we really doing that? And Ryan's like, you don't, you don't get to comment on this. What I think is so powerful about it is it is three grown men honestly and openly discussing their feelings. Now, as is kind of common for Chris Chibnall's writing, sometimes it's a little too on the nose, but I think the sentiment is so important. And it's stuff that needs to be said between these three characters. The temptation could be there to drag it across several episodes of a series. But something Stephen Moffat once said when he was talking about writing sort of unrequited attraction between characters is he said that people don't really act like that in the real world. If they're well-adjusted, sensible people, sooner rather than later, they're going to say, look, I need to talk to you about this and actually have that discussion. We get that with Mitch and Lynn at the beginning of the story and we get that with Ryan and Aaron. Ryan doesn't let Aaron turn this into small talk. He's just like, okay, no, this is what needs to happen. And I think it shows that Graham and Ryan both want Aaron in their lives. They're not rejecting him, but they are hurt by what he did, or rather what he didn't do. And it's such a big part of this plot, especially when Aaron is then taken over by the Khalid creature. Charlotte Ritchie, who plays Lynn, and Daniel Adegboyega both do such a great job of their possessed by the Dalek acting. I especially love the creepy little smile that Charlotte Ritchie has when the Dalek begins to enjoy itself. As for the Dalek itself, on the one hand, I love, I love the makeshift design. I love the different size of Dalek bumps. What I don't quite believe is that Lynn made it in about 20 minutes that it takes for the Doctor to track down the Dalek. But again, it's Doctor Who. You have to suspend your disbelief, pretty much. You have to just accept, of course a Dalek can do that. I don't doubt a Dalek could do that. But a Dalek using a human to do that. You know, it's the speed the human body can work at. Would, it, would Lin really have been able to build the Dalek in that time? I don't know. It makes for an effective montage, as does the bit where Lin first realises she's possessed and we see all those superimposing moments of her face and using the mirror to show the, the dual nature of her and the Dalek creature. That I really like. I like the new design of the Dalek. Maybe some logic doesn't quite work, but it gives Jodie Whittaker another fantastic confrontation scene. She teases the Dalek like Christopher Eccleston's Doctor does. But like with Simshar last week, it's not about screaming and ranting. It's about keeping the Dalek talking. It's about getting inside its head. She does delay it for a little bit, but she doesn't stick around when she realises the Dalek weapon's still working. You know, discretion is a better part of valour. I laugh so heartily when Jodie Whittaker says, now, how long was Arel? Because she's on the back foot for all of this story. So like the Dalek has been robbed of its casing, the Doctor is robbed of her usual advantage and forward thinking because she's having to chase the Dalek and time after time the Dalek is cutting her off, shooting out the cameras, blocking Wi-Fi so it's hard to track it. That scene where the Doctor confronts the Dalek via hologram, it's another one of those great but far too few scenes where Jodie Whittaker is showing some amazing steel and gumption and the kind of rage, suppressed rage, we've come to associate with the Doctor. I like that it's not there all the time, but Jodie does it so well. I wish we'd see it at least once a story. Because we don't, you know, we, we've seen it in Rosa, we've seen it here. We kind of get a glimpse of it in Kablam, we get a glimpse of it last week. Maybe about half the stories we see it in. I want to see that side of Jodie Whittaker more often next series. When the Doctor and her gang, friends, extended fam, confront the Dalek, it's a really great scene. And... Pretty much everyone in this story has been able to contribute something, whether it's Mitch's knowledge of the battle where the Dalek was segmented and sent away, whether it is Lynn fighting against the Dalek long enough for the Doctor to track it down, Aaron bringing the microwave. 
Yaz being the doctor's emotional support, I suppose. Why doesn't Yaz call him police support? I don't know. We do get that, that wonderful unit, basically, Brexit gag. It would be great to see the Doctor and Kate Stewart working together. I hope I see that before Jodie Whittaker goes. But for this story, I like that it is a small group of people taking down one Dalek with ingenuity and using what they have at their disposal rather than heavy artillery. I love the Doctor giving the Dalek the chance to leave. This is a Doctor with possibly the biggest sense of fair play, giving everyone a chance of any other Doctor. Inconsistency has always been part of the Doctor's character. So it is okay to have that inconsistency. It's okay for the Doctor to give the Dalek a chance. She may know that the Dalek is not going to take that chance. But it's interesting that it's so important to her that her friends realise that she gave the Dalek a chance. So maybe she's not doing it for the Dalek at all. Maybe she's doing it because she knows that the Daleks bring out the worst in her and she doesn't want her friends to see her as a murderer if they think the Dalek is just another alien. I don't think there's any danger of that, but that is something else that could play into what we've been seeing with the trailers for next series, with the Doctor saying, you don't know me, there's something coming for me, something from my past. Finally, taking on the Dalek in that form, it's another little Michael Bay moment, but writ small for <laughs> Doctor Who's penchant for big conclusions taking place in small rooms. I love the Doctor's slide. I love her pride in her slide. I love everyone working together to get the components of the microwave on the Dalek. Aaron is then taken over, and that is horrible. The final confrontation against the Dalek creature, dragging it off into the supernova, I kind of wish Ryan had objected more to the Doctor's methods. You know, instead he turns around and says, hey, I did pretty well, and he did do really well to rescue his dad. And the way Chris Chibnall talks about the scene in the special features is that there's meant to be this impression that Ryan forgiving Aaron gives Aaron the strength to fight more against the Dalek and somehow fight against the vacuum of space. I would have liked Ryan to turn around to the Doctor and say, don't you ever do anything like that to my family again. And look, in the trailers for the upcoming series, we do have the Doctor saying things like, you guys don't really know me. And it's true, we could be heading for some of those confrontations next year. Over this series, I feel it's a bit odd we haven't had them a bit more often. And it's a minor complaint because I like these four people getting along, but I feel like this is a situation where Ryan could have justifiably lost his cool. But maybe it would have undercut the tone of the scene. But I think something needed to be said. Much like a New Year's resolution, this story ends with hope for all the characters. Aaron realises what his son and stepfather are doing out in the universe. He gives his blessing and they're left with a better relationship. And they're left with the promise that when they're all on the same planet again, they're gonna get together. Mitch and Lynn are ready to build their relationship together. There's not much discussion of the people who died while Lynn was possessed, but unlike the Ux last week, I feel that would be cruel to bring up for Lynn because she has been struggling and we've seen that as the viewer and the Doctor knows that as well. Resolution does have some plot holes, but it is immensely fun. It is a great action adventure that has a clear emotional through line. Various characters get an emotional journey. Yaz, unfortunately, is a bit underused again. I am really hoping Series 12 addresses this because I think Mandip Gill does an excellent job with at times, not very much material. Resolution gets an eight out of 10 from me. It was an incredibly enjoyable episode. It stands up one year later, and I think it's a much, much better ending to the season than the Battle of Ranskoy Av Kolos, both for sheer quality and because there is a synergy between the first episode and the last episode. There's no opening titles. There is a character who is not one of the leads being terrorised by the monster and the Doctor working to save them anyway. And there is the Doctor basically hoisting the villain, the monster, 
on their own petard. The Dalek wants to go out into space, well the Dalek is going out into space. Simshar wants to detonate his DNA bombs, oh well you can detonate them, but unfortunately they're in your own neck. I really enjoy this. I hope you will come back, I think, tomorrow for my Series 11 wrap-up. Before we get on to Series 12, how good is that going to be? Until then, thank you very much for watching.